Okay, so, so Campbell, thank you very much for joining us. And here you are to talk about your uh, chapter for Senses of Focusing called, uh, the, what's it, the role of the body? In focusing, I think. I think yeah, yeah. And so to begin with, can you just say a little bit about how your view of focusing has changed over the years? Um, yes, I, see, I first heard about focusing on a person-centered training course I did a you know, long, long time ago. Um, I, I, I heard about it because someone did a short workshop and, and mentioned Jendon's little book called Focusing. Um, and, and, and then I, I completed my training and didn't think much about the book at the time because I was more at that time sort of getting into being a, a person-centered counselor. But I think it was six or seven years later um, when I went to a person-centered conference in Gmunden in Austria um, and at that conference, uh, some Japanese counselors talked about a, a Japanese version of person-centered therapy. Um, now, of course, in the standard version, it's very much emphasized what the therapist does, the, the core conditions that are, they embody and, and, and the personal relationship with the therapist. Um, but Tomada, to had a different slant on it. Um, that he saw the therapist's role as really creating a, a space for the client to be with their difficulty without any distraction. Um, and I, I really rather liked that. Um, you know, it, it had a, a difference to it. There was more emphasis on the client than on the therapist. Um, but um, Tomodo's therapy was unknown outside to Japan, so there was no way of getting a training in it. Um, but then someone told me that focusing was a bit similar. Focusing was something similar to Tomoda's. That's what I was told. Yeah, that yeah. A, bit, a bit similar. Um, yeah. Someone who knew them both. Um, and so I, I read about focusing, and then I found out that Jendlin was a philosopher like myself, because I I'd studied philosophy before this. Um, and I, so I did a focusing training with Barbara McGavin. And so that was the be beginning of it. Uh, and then there were about 10 years when I taught focusing and ran focusing courses and wrote about it. Uh, and I began to read Jendlin's philosophical stuff and, and began to have a bit of email discussion with him. Uh, I went to New York to, to have some more discussions because I think I really wanted to get a sense of what Jendlin was doing as a philosopher. Um, and at the same time, I was reading Wittgenstein in some detail, which I hadn't done before. And then, and then it gradually seemed to me that the two don't very easily fit to together and maybe I could say more about that a bit later um, but but Jendlin often says that focusing involves attending to what he calls a, a direct referent and an inner feeling or, or, or sense and felt sense is a, a special kind of bodily sensation something inside you that you can give attention to um, but by then I was well aware that Wittgenstein thinks this talk of inner reference is, is very misleading. Um, and so about the 2010 or so, or a bit before perhaps, I was having some email discussion with Jendon about this. Um, and about, we, about, do, you, do you mean, sorry, about, about this uh, inner, yeah. let's say, since about the inner thing, yes, and the, the, yeah, the what, what, what is going on there when we talk about inner things. Uh, and I mean, to some extent we agreed, and to some extent we, we didn't. Um, it, I suppose, didn't lead to any real 
resolution. I mean, it, we, we did have a kind of long phone conversation because he felt that it was just too difficult um, having to sit down and actually write things out formally and it was took took ages and so on so we tried doing it by phone mm -hmm. but actually I don't think that worked as as well I mean I, I wish now we'd, we'd gone on with the the email discussion because mm -hmm. looking back at it now I just briefly seen some some of the stuff from those times and I, I mean I think we we probably could have reached a better understanding than we actually did um, but, but then, I mean, from the last 10 years or so, I, I've been trying to set out how I think Wittgenstein can give a new perspective on focusing. I mean, it doesn't change what we do in focusing much, or not at all, really, for doing it by yourself. Um, um, but but it, it, it is a different account of focusing, and the, yes. the X explanation of what's involved is, mm -hmm. is, is very different. Mm -hmm. In a conceptual level, hmm, you bring something different. It, it, it brings the yes, that's right. The, the account of, of it is, is different. Yes. Um, just as, as you, an account of some other part of something in psychology, the psychologist would put it like this. Whereas Wittgenstein would say, no, you, you, that's, that's not the right way to, to yes. put it. That, yes. that doesn't really make any sense. And so it was like that. I mean, this um, issue of Wittgenstein and focusing is just like a little fragment of a whole picture about how psychological concepts work, how I talk about psychological things make sense. And you have written about all this in, in many uh, texts of yours, I think. I remember uh, you in Lutraki, <laughs> in yeah. the conference in Greece, Lutraki, yes, talking yes. about the same issue, the, the same thing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, it's something I've been trying to do in different ways for the quite a number of years now and it's it's just trying to find different ways of putting it because yeah. it it clearly is difficult to get across and I mean other Wittgensteinian philosophers find this difficulty very regularly when they talk to psychologists mm. but there's a kind of a, a fundamental difference in ways of doing things and it's hard, hard to get hold of. Yes. And may, maybe you could say something about um, the felt sense at this point, because that, that features in your chapter. And you have a very particular take on the felt sense. Yes, yes. I mean, th this whole discussion really arose out of the... the, the issues of surrounding the idea of a felt sense and it it was partly my experience of teaching focusing and finding that students often they they didn't take the idea of a felt sense in quite the right way I mean they would know that it's some sort of sensation in the center of the body but then they would spend a lot of time looking at the actual sensations they had in the center of their body and the muscle tensions or sinking feelings in the stomach. And, you know, they would get a long way away from the problem that they were initially working with. So that, that, there, was, there was that contribution that it was actually causing difficulties, the way Gendlin put it. Um, and, and then there was the Wittgensteinian idea that inner things shouldn't be thought of as as things at all that, that that's the wrong way to to think about it so there's so there were two inputs to it um i mean i don't it might help i thought that if i just went back to you know the beginnings of focusing you could see gendlin's initial book was well before focusing oriented therapy got off the ground. And I think some of the early things he says are actually much clearer than the 
things he said later on in his work. Because at the beginning, folk scene was discovered through listening to therapy sessions. Um, that Rogers and Jen Lynn were, were concerned with which kinds of sessions are most helpful for clients. Um, and so they, they simply listened to hundreds or even thousands of, of, of sessions. And it's in a way, the whole thing is fairly straightforward that a person comes to counseling because they have a problem or you know, something that's troubling them. And they talk about it a bit. You know, they, they give some sustained attention to it. And then they pause and it's clear that they're still attending to the problem. It's not because they're embarrassed or frightened of what the therapist said or anything like that. Um, so they pause and then they say something like, well, it's sort of like this. And they pause again and then, no, it's not quite that. It's more like, uh, there are these gaps in what they're saying and the therapist may not say anything. Um, but clearly they're, they're doing something. And the question about focusing is really, well, what are they doing? And, and you know, I think the answer to that basically is that they're attending to their problem for sure. And then they just seem to be waiting and then something comes to them. And then the problem's a bit different because it's now a problem that has this new bit in it that it didn't before. And then, so then they attend to it again and wait again. I mean, that's the sort of thing that Jendin was hearing on the tapes. Sometimes nothing happens, nothing comes. And the client may say, well, I, I just have a blank. And at other times they say, well, ah, there is something here, but I can't put it into words yet. Or I had a glimpse of what this is all about, but it's gone again. Or I have a glimmering or of inkling of what this needs, but I can't quite get hold of it. And th those are the sorts of places in the sessions that Janin was interested in. They're the places where something changes a bit. Um, and it's, it's that sort of point that Jendlin, it's that, at that sort of point that Jendlin brings in the idea of a felt sense. So uh, the felt sense is, is when a client can't yet say something, but they hope to do so soon, they expect to do so, it's on, they might say, well, it's on its way, I haven't quite got it. And then they may say, ah, now I think I've got it. You know, that's it. Now I can go on. See, I think that's what you can see of focusing if you look at therapy. And I think the sort of point Wittgenstein would make here is that, well, that may be, at least sometimes, all that happens. There doesn't have to be anything else. The other things might go on. I mean, the client might feel some muscle tensions or as they wait for something to come to them because it's frustrating and I can't find a way of saying it. Or they might have a gnawing sensation in their stomach. I mean, or words or images might come to them. But for Wittgenstein, gee, those, are, those are incidental things. I mean, what, what they're doing is attending and, and, and waiting. So, so I mean, that, 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 there's the purely um, empirical bit, the, the fact of what people do when they're focusing. And I think what I've said is that that's about what it is. And to explain focusing to someone, I don't think you need to say much more than that. Mm -hmm. So uh, th it is attending to the whole situation and then articulating it further. Yes, exactly. And that's, I think that's a good way of, of, of putting it. And people find yeah, when they follow the focus in instructions that yeah, they, they can do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it happens when, when, you, you, when you pause and wait and sort of, as it were, listen to, to yourself. Yes. So there is a kind of a, 
of a responding process to the whole situation, to the whole problem. Yeah, exactly. And I think what Jenden's you know, great discovery really is that people can do that. You, you actually can attend to a whole situation. Yes. You don't have to analyze it and go into the details. Yes. You can just, just talk around it a bit and then just sort of refer to, well, that, that whole thing. Yes. And then if you're, if you're fortunate, something will come and the whole thing will then be rather different. Yes. There's a series of steps. Our body, our bodies can do that. To, to attend. Well, uh, yes, you see, this is exactly, yeah, that's exactly Not, not right. only body, body, mind, or, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, you see, I think if you pin it down to body or mind, yeah or some philosophical notion like that, see, then I think you can easily go off on the wrong track. Yes. My, my, my body yes. knows this. I don't know it. My body knows it. I remember that was one thing I mentioned to Jen, and I, I said to him with my ord ordinary language sort of philosophy background, well, look, you, you, you can't say that your, your body knows things. You know things, but bodies don't know things. <laughs> And he said, well, yes, of, of course, but what a striking way to put it. <laughs> when, I, when I say my body can, can attend to the situation, I take the body some like a, the primary base of the mind also. Uh, but I agree with you. Maybe body mind is much more clear. I, she, I, or you, you as a whole, as you said, you, you attend to the problem. Yes, it's, it's really, it's, it's just you doing these things. Once you start to talk about body and mind, you're into a sort of philosophical framework because we don't, I mean, we do use obviously words like body and mind, but they're not used the way that philosophers use them. But, I mean, uh, sorry. No, go on, yeah. Where, where, where is the murky edge? Oh, you see, the murky edge is the point where you, you can, you know that you need to say something, um, but you can't yet say it. I mean, it's, you sense that it's on its way. There's something here. It's murky because you don't have the words for it. Now, you see, you, you can have a metaphorical picture of that and, as here's this vague, murky thing. And, and maybe within it, there are sharp, clearly defined things. See, I think Jendon uses a lot of pictures like that. But I don't think they should be taken literally. It's, it's not really that in the middle of your chest, you have a murky thing. I mean, because that doesn't really make any sense. I mean, it's unless you just mean I'm not sure what to say about this yet. Because yes. I think that's what it really means. We, we take these expressions metaphorically. <clears throat> sure. I think if you take them metaphorically, then there needn't be any problem. But yes. there's something about the way Gendlin does it that, that encourages people to take them fairly literally. But is it so bad, after all, to, to take them also literally? I mean, they may be a door into attending to the situation also, also here. Um, uh, absolutely. I mean, you think in practice, it doesn't often cause problems. Yes. But yes. it does sometimes. I mean, yes. it, and it causes problems for people who are, are trying to understand what focusing is. They're not just mm -hmm. doing it. They want mm -hmm. to understand it. They want to understand what is a felt sense. Mm -hmm. And, and then you get into questions of, well, it's a, a sensation in the middle of the body. And yeah, you know, I think yeah. then, then you're lost. And it's... Yes. yes. I, I think that the whole, uh, let's say, view one has <clears throat> regarding emotions, regarding all these psychological uh, concepts is very, is very important. And I think that in this psych psychology world, we have very different 
approaches to what emotions are. Mm. And some, uh, <clears throat> they accept that there is something in here <laughs> hidden, hidden waiting to be discovered maybe, mm. but there is also another and totally different uh, approach. It's not about in here, something hidden, but it is about the situation. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's right. I mean, it's the issues in connection with um, emotions, I think are, are very much the same as with the felt sense. But, I mean, mm -hmm. if, if some, suppose someone is, is hopeful, um, now she is hope, an inner thing that you can kind of look at yeah. you feel hopeful maybe some people would say yes i feel hopeful in my body the hope is is there in the body um but you see it's not the way the word is actually used in practice i mean we, we know that someone is hopes for something without knowing what bodily sensations they have. I mean, there, there, there may be all sorts of sensations, but it doesn't matter that, you know, to, to you know, hope for something is something like, well, you would be disappointed if it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a whole, it's a whole context. It's a yeah. hope, Wittgenstein says, is a, is a pattern in human life. It's not an inner, inner thing. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's in, the, it's in, it's in your relationship with the rest of the the world but it's yes you cannot take out let's say hope from sure. the from the situation from the actual uh, situation yeah. yes Ex yes exactly and and of course then that has quite big implications for talk about oh the, the brain because you see people want to correlate mental states inner mental states with states of the brain but if Wittgenstein is right I mean there's, there's no chance of doing that because it's not an inside thing at all, or it's, it's not just something inside, or what's inside isn't very important. See, I mean, there's, I think there's a whole sort of picture we have of, of the mind, mental states being inside us. And we also have the, the fact that our brain cells are inside us, and then those two things get mixed up together. So, I mean, it, it sort of muddles within muddles. Yes. What about in a in a in a broader sense that when you feel um, when I feel hopeful or um, I'm feeling some certain things, I have an inner sense of expansion, and other things lead to a sense of contraction. Yes, I, um, Just I mean, well, I, I think yes, I think. I imagine that would be fairly common experience, that sort of expansive mm. thing with, with hope. And, and um, so, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, there, there can be all sorts of bodily responses and bodily feelings. Um, but see, what I think you can't do is saying simply that is the emotion. Because, I mean, you, you could feel expansive for all sorts of other reasons. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. It's just, I, I think it's it's very hard to put words on some of these things. It's, see, I think that, that see, the words are already there. I mean, words like hope work perfectly well if you don't start thinking about how they work, if you, if you don't do philosophy with them. I mean, hope is a completely straightforward thing that children learn about. Um, you see, in explaining to a child what it is to hope for something, you, you don't go into the sort of details that psychologists and philosophers would go into about inner things or brain states or anything like that. You talk about this is the sort of situation where we say someone is, is hopeful. Do you think that an image can hold us captured? Oh, absolutely, I do. Absolutely. <laughs> I, mean, I, I see, I think that is... Uh, is what is going on here. We do have yeah. this very powerful image of the inner. I mean, it's very, very difficult to, to get away from it. And of course, corresponding to it, we have the idea of the outer. Uh, and you see, and for Wittgenstein, see, this is just as much a problem. 
it's this whole dualistic way of seeing things as dividing the world into you know, matter and consciousness or mind and body. I mean, that, that's where the heart of it is, the problem. One of the um, questions that we have is, if you were after this gap, if you are now to have a conversation with Jendlin, what would you like to say to him now? I suppose some of the things I've just been been saying, and, and then I would have to see how he responded to to them. Um, see, I mean, Jen, Jen had read Wittgenstein. I mean, he was fairly familiar, not, not perhaps with the, the very last writings of Wittgenstein, because they hadn't been published at the time. Um, so in principle, I don't see why it, wouldn't be possible to, you know, to to have a Gendlin Wittgenstein dialogue, as it were. I mean, what would come of that? I, I don't quite know. I don't think. I mean, I don't think Gendlin quite grasped what Wittgenstein was was up to. But I'm I'm maybe wrong. And he felt that he, he he valued Wittgenstein's work, but he, he was going beyond it. So I don't know. It, yeah. it, the, the emphasis is different, maybe. I mean. It, it is, it is, I guess. But I mean, Jenin obviously was, to some extent, a, a creature of his time, and and so he was very much into the idea of you know, what is subjective, needing to have some external um, reflection, and you you get at psychological things through the physical behavior. Uh, and you see, I, th I think he maybe he never quite got away from that kind of way of thinking about psychology. Because I think all, all the way through, and I looked at this a bit recently, he does bring in the inner, the self. Although, though in his later philosophical writing, it's all very much to do with interaction rather than the subjective. Yes. But I never quite, you know, sorted the problems out there. I think that he, he may be used different dictionaries, different kinds of languages, more simple, more common, more philosophical, at different uh, <clears throat> books and articles. I, I think that's, that's right. I mean, he was in a difficult position. I mean, because he is writing partly for therapists who mostly know no philosophy. And he was writing for philosophers who know nothing about therapy. Yeah. And so, I mean, it, on the whole, his writings are fairly separate. But of course, he he couldn't really separate the two things. So I think I think it was an incredibly difficult situation for him. Yes, and and when you have to deal with something very much empirical, like focus the focusing process, then. One can do focusing <laughs> by using, let's say, <clears throat> different languages, different dictionaries. I, I think yes, people doing focusing tend to speak more, more metaphorically, more poetically, and yeah. yeah. Would you say that you you some somehow try to <clears throat> uh, to rephrase to? To, to present for the focusing process with a new simple language in your new book about focusing yes yes i think i think that's that's right it's if, i think in the in the new book i really want to get away from the philosophical things and just present focusing as as something that in fact people very often do or they do something very like it when they sit down and ponder over their problems and it's it's not very different from from that and it's not very different from what artists and 
poets do when they mm. they have something they want to express and they try this and they try that and then that's not quite right i mean there's a whole creative sort of process which i i think is common to focusing and any any sort of creative work and, and to uh, scientific thinking because i think thinking at the edge is a you know it's applying focusing in a different context yes I'm just thinking as you as you look back over your career, do you what what have you gained from knowing about Gendlin's philosophy, Gendlin's practice as a psychotherapist, and the whole invention of focusing as a taught procedure? Um, well, I, I've I've found it. Well, partly I first found focusing helpful in, in, in practice, just if I have something that's, that's difficult, then I, then I do some focusing. And, and, and usually it, I, 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 at the end of the session, I, I do feel different. I mean, it, it works, if you like. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm really grateful to him for just having set out this, uh, um, this thing that people can, can do that can help themselves. And, and, and then it's, it's important to me that something like focusing happens in therapy. And I suspect something like it happens in most kinds of therapy. It's just not the bit that some of the theories focus on. But I think, I, I suspect it is absolutely central to, to most psychotherapy. And, and the gender is sort of spelt out in some detail, see how focusing can come into other kinds of therapy. Is, is that what you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yes. That's the. Uh, I suppose that's the. That's the you as a therapist um, part of it that you really see the you know the relevance and the helpfulness mm. of focusing there. I'm just wondering, in terms of you as a philosopher, how Thank knowing you. his work as as well. So it's sort of it's a both and question. Yes. Yes. I mean, well, the philosophy really does interest me very much. I mean, I think he his attempts to to deal with things as a whole i mean i think it's something that really does need to be done and hasn't really been done well enough by philosophers i mean that there are some philosophers who have you know sort of holistic systems and whitehead is is one and then there are eastern systems that, that really deal pretty seriously with wholes and the relation of the whole to the, 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 the if you, parts, if you, if the parts not quite the right word, but the facets of the, the whole. I mean, there's a whole big question there of how whole things relate to their own facets, mm. um, which I, I, th I think would be really good to have more people working on. I, mean, I think Gendlin has made a, you know, a, a very sort of brave attempt to to get to this this sort of thinking yes thank you thank you i think we've more or less covered all our questions in i uh, can you think of anything else nikos that we that we might want to add or you might want to add campbell um no i think that's pretty much what covers the sorts of things i wanted to talk about yeah okay well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> <laughs> and we are looking forward to reading your your new book. The new book, which is which is just about done oh. now. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Is there anything more you'd like to say about the new book? Do you feel you've? I'm not much i mean it's it's in a way it takes me right back to the beginning of my focusing time and be, because it goes back to gendlin's initial book which she itself was a, a self-therapy book and that's where it began um and so I, I i initially thought of it simply as a a kind of updated after 40 years version of 
his book. I mean, actually, it's turned out to be rather different, but partly because all sorts of things have happened in the last 40 years. So it, it couldn't just be a, a revised version of, of Gendlin's book. So it's, it's turned out to be rather different in the end. But yeah. that, that's, it's the same sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's a book that says, look, here's something that you can do. And many people find it helpful. And these are the difficulties you can run into. And, and you might like to try this as well. It's, it's, it's that sort of book. I think it's it's very much a you book. <laughs> what is that? I, I think it is a very characteristic Campbell book. <laughs> I mean, it's lovely. It's very, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very you rather than Gentlin, I think. Okay. Yes. Yes, I do feel that I have. I did spend a good many years. Um, kind of absorbing Gendlin and sort of channeling <laughs> Gendlin uh, and yes and it took a lot of time to to sort of get out of out of that actually. Hmm. So where next? I would like to look at this whole business of um, holes and Gendlin's everything and everything idea. I mean that's the, the core of this sort of philosophy i don't know we shall, we shall see it would be a, i think it would be a pretty philosophical thing if i do write another book which i i may or may not i don't know we we look forward to it <laughs> thank you everything by everything <laughs> yes everything yeah. Okay, so can, should we stop recording before yes. just switch off and go away? Okay, yeah.